Thank you, Neely Ann. Rong Chao, do you mind going next? Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Rong Chao Ten, and uh, I'd like to get go by with Rong Chao. And I will be a new adjunct faculty with the English department, and I will teach um, writing and grammar. Thank you. Thank you. We're so glad that you're with us at National State and becoming part of our family and becoming an adjunct with us. Thank Tim, you. do you mind going next? Sure. Yeah, I'm Tim Matthews. Um, I've taught at Nashville State for um, several years on and off. So I'm returning adjunct in ESL. And I'll be teaching um, reading and speaking and listening this term. We are grateful to have you continuing to stay with us in the great work that you do with our ESO program. Michelle, do you mind going next? Oh, sure. I'm Michelle Williams. And um, I'm brand new, uh, just started. I'm going to be teaching um, for the business department. I'm going to be teaching economics and um, computer applications, uh, Microsoft Office Suite. Right. That is wonderful. Welcome also to our Nashville State family. We're grateful to have you with us. Tamara, would you like to introduce yourself next? Hello, everyone. My name is Tamara Sanders. I like to go by Tamara, but I know some people, when they see the name, they don't know how to pronounce it, so I, Tam works just fine. <laughs> I'm a very, very, very new adjunct uh, professor where I will be teaching database concepts. And it's, mm. I'm excited to be here. We are excited to have you and thank you for helping me know how to pronounce your name correctly. I appreciate that greatly. Today, as we dive into the adjunct workshop, we wanna give you some foundations. And as Neely Ann said just a moment ago, this isn't something where you need to be stressed to have all of it with you. Instead, we really want to be allowing you to know that we're here to help you through, but to help you be confident as you walk in on the first day of class. And so as we start, the first thing that we want to talk about is course delivery modes for fall 2021. Please realize that on the course schedule, it tells you exactly what type of course you're teaching, whether it's fully online, hybrid, where part's online, part is face-to-face, -face, virtual, where it's all via Zoom, or being face-to-face, -face, regardless of your mode of delivery please be sure to post information into your course shell so that there'll be information for your students there and also help your students understand what your course delivery is because with all the different options after the last year and a half, sometimes students may be confused as they walk in the first day. So making sure that you emphasize what your class mode of delivery is is going to be helpful for you and for your students. And we wanted to immediately provide you with some links and we can put these in the chat for you also. But the first link is to our online learning website. And there's another training this next week for online learning, but it provides you links to help you with getting started to know what your skills are. And that link is now in the chat. And they also can provide additional support for you. And so I want to go ahead and I just messed up and did the wrong copy, but this will take you to our teaching center website to have many, many more additional links for you as we move forward. And so most importantly, you're not alone. And that's the message we want you to have today. Whether you're new or been here multiple years, you have resources at Nash State to help support you as you are teaching. And now, Neely Ann, we're going to talk about the first week of class. So um, it's the first, well, we're going to be starting the first week of class. And a lot of our students are nervous. A lot are returning to school. Uh, they're new college students or adult learners. So we really want to make sure that we make a positive first impression or a really strong uh, first impression. And we think about the first day strategies. Uh, and again, some of these things seem like uh, of course, you would do that, but um, it's just easy sometimes to forget or not include it all. So we really like to highlight the importance of the first day. And 
number one to me is be familiar with the technology. And this is for meeting virtually and or in person. Because again, some of you may be doing some hybrid options, some Zoom, some of you may be all in person. But feeling comfortable with the equipment you're going to be using. So either going a different day or getting there early, logging in, turning on the camera, making sure you can pull up a PowerPoint if you're going to do it. You want to do all of that before uh, the students get there because, you, you, of course, you want to seem competent, but also you want to be comfortable. Uh, and if you're trying to greet students and get comfortable with technology and all at the same time, it's also a missed opportunity to connect with students. So, again, I highly encourage you that you're comfortable with that because this is gonna set the tone for the entire semester. You know, different research says different amount of seconds, but we all know that really a first impression is within the first minute. So it's really important to be thinking about the tone that you're gonna set. And so part of that is calling role, but it, my suggestion would be, especially if you're in person, get there early so you can greet students as they come in individually. Uh, I know some of us will be keeping some space, so you might not walk right up into someone's personal space to ask their name, but you can still absolutely greet them individually, ask their name, maybe ask if there's a, a pronunciation or a, what they want to be called, and having as much of that one-on-one -on -one contact you, that you can before the class even starts is a wonderful opportunity, and it usually just means getting there maybe 10 minutes early, but when you are calling the roll, uh, make sure you ask how do you pronounce your name or is this correct? Or if somebody, you know, you say Jameson and then they repeat back Jamie, say, you know, would you like to be called Jamie? The more we can call people by the names that they prefer, the more comfortable they're going to feel. And we want to start building community. And this also lets other students know, how should I refer to my classmates? So don't be shy about that. There's going to be names you can't pronounce uh, without a doubt. Don't be shy, ask. I know even my name seems pretty basic to me, but I can't tell you how many times I've been called Nelly instead of Neely. Uh, <laughs> and I much prefer Neely Ann than, to Nelly. So, uh, you know, if somebody asked me that, I'm much more relieved that they asked than just continuing with the wrong pronunciation. So don't be shy about that. When we review the syllabus, and I know that's common sense that it would be part of first day, I highly encourage you to go through your syllabus and really pick out the things that you want to verbalize and actually talk through with the students, because we don't want to read the whole syllabus to the students because we're going to lose them quickly. Uh, that's not going to be very attention getting or connecting, but really go through and figure out what's most important to me. What if I was a student, what would I want to know? And from that, it's usually expectations. But again, we don't want to just read through our syllabus. We want to think about what are the things that we need to verbally highlight, go through, maybe talk through with students? And then what are the things that they can read on their own? And of course, make it clear they need to do that, but it's not necessary to read through the whole thing. But it is definitely the opportunity to set your expectations, let your class get comfortable with what are you going to be doing uh, so that when they leave the class, they feel confident that they understand what the class is going to be and what the expectations are. Uh, and definitely introduce yourself. Um, you're, you want to share your expertise and experience. But I also want to add to that, share something that makes you a human being to them. Be comfortable with some level of self-disclosure so that they know you're not just a teacher. Because the you self-disclosing about yourself and creating that comfortable environment is going to create an environment that students feel comfortable to do that. Some of our students are intimidated by the idea of a college professor. And if you only share, this is my experience and these are my degrees, uh, it doesn't really humanize us as people. So again, think about what you want to share ahead of time. It might be a little bit about you or your family or what you like to do, uh, music you like. It can be anything, but really think about what can I share that makes me a person uh, to these people? Because uh, we need that connection for them to want to be drawn to our classes. Which leads me to, and I, I, so many faculty say, I don't have time to do that. My response is leave out something else because for people to want to come back, they need to feel like they belong in some way. And the only way to do that is to let them participate and do some type of icebreaker activity. They can tell a little bit about themselves. You can pair them up. They can share a most embarrassing moment. They can tell why they're excited about school. You can pick any prompt that you want and it can be very informal, but 
without that, it's just a bunch of strangers leaving the room. So again, this doesn't have to be half your class period. It can be something that takes 10 minutes, but uh, not only do I believe it, a great deal of research supports the idea of some type of icebreaker activity. So I highly encourage you to do that. So that's first day. Um, every class, and I just want to highlight this again, especially since some of you are new, uh, and just in case, make sure you know, you definitely want to call roll every class period and welcome students by name. Obviously, that might not happen the very first day of class. I mean, the second day of class, because you might not know everyone yet. But by calling roll, we're more likely to learn their name. Again, if you can have that one-on-one -on -one interaction, get there a few minutes early. Um, and I should have mentioned this earlier. You all, if you are, or how many of you are in Zoom? I should just ask that before I even, any of, a couple of you. Okay, so the same applies for a Zoom room. You can get through your Zoom room early, talk to them as they come in. Uh, so it doesn't have to be in person to get there early. And that little bit of time allows for that connection. And it makes it easier to learn people's names as well. Uh, Zoom also is very helpful with the name because their name is on the screen, <laughs> which is awesome. That was my favorite part of Zoom. Uh, so, and if they don't have their name up there, uh, they can easily change it just with the three dots. So if you're in a Zoom class and you see there's just a phone number up there, or it's a generic label, just ask your students, uh, you know, will you please put your name on your Zoom screen because I wanna be able to uh, call you by name. They can change it to, if they have a nickname they prefer, they can even put that on the Zoom screen. And it's literally just the three dots in the top right corner allows people to change their name. So it's super easy, no advanced technology needed whatsoever. Each class period, you wanna review the objectives of the class and you know whether that's chapter objectives or you have specific individual objectives you've come up with, but basically you wanna preview at the beginning, what's our point of being here today? What are we going to accomplish? And that's helpful for your students to know the why, why am I here, what, what's gonna happen here? But then it also allows you, if you've given an overview of these objectives, then it also makes it easier to connect the topics and concepts to the real world. In other words, okay, this is what we're gonna learn. Uh, and this is the why, because this is how I can connect it to my real life. Uh, and whether that be in their daily life, like for example, Amy and I both teach communication. So everything we talk about, we're constantly saying, and how does this apply in your real life? Uh, but whether it's a math class, how are they gonna use that? A computer class, it could be how they're gonna use it in the class. Uh, to be successful in the class, but then also how they're going to use it in their daily lives. Because just like you all joining this little workshop today, I'm sure your number one question is, what can I do with this information? How is it going to benefit me, right? I don't, most people don't join in just because they have time to waste. <laughs> they usually are looking for information that's relevant and valuable. And our students are the same. So however we can make it relevant and valuable to them is not only going to make it easier for us as teachers, but it's going to make it um, long lasting for them. Use multiple learning strategies. You all, we have a variety of students. We have a diverse student population, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But using diver uh, multiple learning strategies allows us to reach more students. So there's verbal delivery. You want to be thinking about your nonverbal. There's visual aids, video clips, PowerPoint storytelling, photographs, all time. I mean, there's so many things that we can use to make it not just us. And that's really important. Attention span time, they don't, none of us, not just our students, none of us have an hour of just straight attention that we can give. So put them into groups, have them do a little activity, or even if it's an individual activity, think, pair, share, ask a question, have a short class discussion, spreading these things throughout instead of, I mean, our job as teachers is not to lecture for if your class is an hour, an hour. It is to create, deliver the material in a way that helps them understand it, but then also apply it and connect and use it. So I cannot stress that one enough. Um, one way, and I so wish that somebody had told me that when I was 25 and starting teaching, because <laughs> I definitely thought it was my job to talk the whole time, and th that's what I was being paid for, and um, it's way too much pressure on the teacher, but it's also just not our best learning option for students, so using a variety, uh, which leads us to the diversity element. You all, this is a huge asset at, at Nashville State. It can create a rich learning environment, and we have all types of students. And 
your job is never going to be boring. We have first generation students. We have students that are returning from the workforce. We have many ESL students as Tim, I think you said you're working with our ESL students, um, socioeconomic diversity, age diversity. I mean, we have all the diversity that you could ever want in a classroom. And it makes it so interesting and so fun to teach. But with that means we are going to need to use a variety of teaching tools. We're going to need to be empathic with our students. We're going to need to stand in their shoes and think about what would it be like to be that student. Uh, the expectation of our students are just ready for college is an unrealistic expectation because we have some that are extremely ready. They know what to expect. They're gonna be great students. And we have some that are brand new. Their parents didn't go to college, their first generation. They have no idea what it's like to be in class. So, and I don't want that to be worrisome to you as far as like, oh, what am I gonna do? We wanna use it in ways of thinking, how can I reach as many people as possible? And again, variety in your teaching strategies and flexibility and empathy are your friends without a doubt. Uh, one other thing I wanna mention is technology. You're going to have students all over from highly competent with technology, more competent than you are, except for maybe Michelle, because I think you deal with computer stuff. I think that's what you said. But and then you're going to have some that don't know how to log into D2L. Uh, we have an online learning division. They have so many resources available. That link that Amy put in the chat will take you to it. You're able to use it. Our students are able to use those resources. You can contact online learning directly for help. Our students can connect to them for help. So I want you to know there's almost more than you need as far as support from technology. You just have to reach out and get it. So I don't want you to think as a teacher, well, I, I don't have time to be the expert technology person if I'm also teaching the class. You know, if there's something you don't know how to do or, or a student needs help doing, absolutely reach out to online learning. That's what they're there for. We have a new director. Uh, he's doing a great job. I, again, so many resources are available there. But any questions before we move forward to talk about the syllabus? Anything at all? Don't be shy. You turn okay. Neely in and I say multiple times, community, support, multiple learning strategies, diversity. Whenever we keep saying these words, we're really emphasizing culturally responsive teaching practices. If we welcome our students into the classroom every time, it gives them a sense of belonging. If we provide additional resources, they feel that the community at Nashville State supports them, accepts them, and as a result, they're more likely to engage in the classroom and learn better. And so as we talk about these culturally responsive teaching practices, one, we as faculty want to feel like we are knowledgeable and accepted when we go in the classroom, but we also want to transfer that feeling to our students. So they feel like the classroom is a place where they are welcomed, whether it's in person or fully online, they know that they belong there. Because when we feel like we belong, we're going to be able to learn more. And as we talk about first day strategies and first week strategies, I want to go back and emphasize our syllabus. Your syllabus sets the standard for your course. And so you want to spend time with your syllabus and look at policies in depth. Now your dean, director, or program coordinator course lead has a copy of the master syllabus for every course. That includes all of the policies that have to be there for Nashville State. But we also want you to think about additional policies. What's your cell phone or electronic device policy? If you're in Zoom virtually every class, they're going to have technology there. But do you want to address the fact that you are asking them to put their cell phones away while they're in class with you? Are you asking them to put their phones on mute? Are you going to have requirements of cameras on or cameras off during certain parts of class? All of these types of policies are things that you can spell out from the beginning to help you and your students understand what the expectations are. And if we set those standards at the beginning of the semester, it's much easier for us to enforce them as we move through. 
be specific with these policies and procedures. Know what your standards are for attendance. Are you taking attendance each time you call roll? Yes, we are. So we know when our students are there, but we also want to spell out what the attendance policy is. What is our behavior policy in the classroom? What do we need to do to help our class run well? One thing that I found that helps me run well is a class acknowledgement. And there's an example on the next slide. And after we review the syllabus, I give this to my students and they sign it and they tell me that they have read the syllabus, they understand the syllabus, and they are ready to abide by the syllabus. And that way, if something comes up in week 10 of the semester, I can pull it back out and say, we agreed to this on week one. Let's follow it for these last five weeks to help us move through. And if you notice, there's some other things under there. I asked for their actual name their contact phone number, an alternate email address. So if they disappear from class, I can check up on them and make sure they're doing okay. On mine, I ask them, what's one important thing about you that I should know? Sometimes the answer is, I like the color blue. Other times they tell me that they're working four part-time jobs and going to school full-time. This is a great way to learn about your students but in a way where they're not having to raise their hand and share it in front of everyone. When we ask students about these, it helps us, again, start building community and connection with our students. On the Teaching Center's website, on our resources page, there are different types of policies available for you because we know that starting from scratch isn't always comfortable. And so we wanted you to know that there are examples available that you can go to and pull from to be able to use. And that's available online for you. Now and you let's can act talk about actually managing the classroom. Um, you all and the Teaching Center website, uh, and Amy will drop that in the chat. This is it. Again, there are past workshops you can watch, examples, all of that. It's available 24 seven. Uh, so please use it as a resource. It is there for all of you anytime. Uh, and if you ever have things that you think should be added or that you have something in, that you would like us to post to share with other faculty that would be beneficial, uh, please reach out to us. It's very much an open door. Contact us, let us know how you're doing, what you need. And again, if you have anything you wanna share to help other faculty. Um, so teaching and classroom management, um, regardless if you're Zoom or in person or a combination of both. Um, and I, I would say, just as a general note to that, I think flexibility at this point is key as we move forward for this semester, because, you know, we just don't know how things are going to pan out. But regardless, uh, we want to remember that people learn differently. And as I said earlier, variety is absolutely essential. And I emphasize this because it's really easy to go with what we're comfortable with. So, for example, I've been teaching communication 25 years, so to talk some about it, share some PowerPoints, do an activity that I'm comfortable with that. And that works well, but I shouldn't just get comfortable with that because there might be students that would really benefit from a short video clip or from pairing up specifically with their classmates and doing an activity and sharing. So the more variety that we can use, again, the more likely we are to reach more students. And, uh, you know, as far as, I teach communication, so I'm thinking of it in terms of an audience. And the, our goal is to reach as many people in the audience as possible. Even though it's a classroom, it's still an audience. It's a pe group of people we're trying to reach. And in order to do that, we have to do a variety of things uh, to reach those. One other, it sounds like such basic common sense, but it is hard to do in the classroom, but it's essential you all be comfortable leaving silence after you ask a question because some of our students are not going to jump right in. Uh, and it's gonna feel awkward, especially through Zoom. For some reason for me, Zoom silence seems like it lasts 12 times as long <laughs> as in-person silence, but be comfortable, leave that pause there because it also leaves space for those students that aren't their ones with their first hand up, you know, cause you've got those two or three in every class that are always gonna answer. Pausing, leaving some space, 
leaves space for other students to speak up as well. So get really comfortable with silence. Um, I even joke with my students like, you all, I can do this silence thing. So we're, we're gonna wait until some of you are ready to share or ready to ask questions or whatever it is. So uh, get comfortable with that uh, because it's part of it. And then PowerPoint and visual aids effectively. Visual aids are extremely helpful as a teaching tool, or even just it, we think about it in terms of public speaking, but teaching is a type of public speaking. You all, PowerPoint should be something that enhances what you're talking about. It should not be what you're talking about. Uh, we don't want everything we're saying word for word on a slide. We don't want paragraphs on a slide because if there's paragraph, if there's a paragraph, so if there was a paragraph up there right now of what I was saying, what would you all be doing? Reading. Reading. And so if you're reading, what are you not doing? Listening. It's, it is literally that simple, but you all, I cannot tell you how many classrooms we go in and you'll see paragraph after paragraph. Um, and that's just because, again, Amy and I are lucky that we teach a topic that then also applies to actually teaching. So um, use like what we do here, short words and phrases. Uh, if it's obviously a quotation or something like that, use full sentences, but really keep it brief. Um, so that it's enhancing what you're talking about. Same thing with the video. If you're going to use a video, if you've talked about the concept for 10 minutes, the video doesn't need to be 10 minutes, right? So really you want to think about it using it in terms of the time that you're spending with it and the attention that you're getting from your audience. And is it going to have payoff? Because really a visual aid should help the audience either understand, ret retain, or get the attention of your audience. So it's not necessary to have a PowerPoint all the time, right? It's, it's not necessary to have a visual aid all the time, but when we are, or when we do, we want to use them effectively. Those of you who are just starting out, if you are uncomfortable with visual aids or you want some extra help, again, Amy and I both are in the teaching center, but we also both teach communication courses, which means we both teach visual aids. Uh, don't, don't hesitate to send us an email. We would be happy to set up an individual Zoom session with you, walk you through some things uh, like that, that we're happy to do that. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention, well, two more things, uh, communication with your classes. This is the Nashville state policy, meaning campus-wide as far as what it says with how we will communicate with emails. That's a starting place. I highly encourage you in your syllabus to be very clear about how long it will take you to email back, grades posted, all of that, because by setting those expectations, not only do you hold yourself accountable, it lets students know what they can expect, and it also keeps you from getting emails that you don't need. Uh, if you are clear that grades are posted within 48 hours, then you won't start getting emails after 24 hours. Well, at least not as many emails. So it helps us hold ourselves accountable, but also lets students know how long it's gonna take you to respond. As you can see from the Nashville state policy, the expectation is 24 hours during normal business hours, Monday through Friday. And I like to emphasize that because sometimes with all the stuff you're getting when you're new, you don't necessarily see that. Uh, and I will say from teaching for decades at this point, one of the most important things I think is getting back to students as soon as possible, uh, because to them, their question is the most important thing. Uh, it usually is keeping them from moving forward in the class uh, or accomplishing something or working on a project or an assignment. So that in no way am I saying you need to be available all the time. I'm saying if when you start your day of teaching work, to me, the most important thing is getting back with the students who have emailed or whether it's a voicemail, how some of you may decide to give phone numbers, all of that's up to you, but just follow through with whatever your whatever you put on your syllabus. And it's really important that it's there on your syllabus. And more communication with your classes, timely feedback with your grades. Again, put it in your syllabus when and how quickly you'll grade, be consistent with that, and then give them feedback whenever possible, especially if it, there's not face-to-face -face feedback happening. Um, and when we think about giving feedback with grades, you all, when we're dealing with something positive, you second person, you say it all day long, because if I'm saying to Tim, you did really well on your vocal presentation and the delivery, that's going to help with positive self-esteem. You're giving direct positive feedback to the person. When it's something that needs to be 
corrected or improved, which is, it's going to happen, right? That's what we're supposed to do as teachers. Very rarely do we have a student that doesn't need um, any improvement or correction because they wouldn't be in school if they didn't need it. But third person really helps. Um, so for example, I might, for an outline they turned in, I might, instead of saying, Tim, your outline needs this, I would just say, the outline needs to have more detail. The outline wasn't fully developed. The outline needs to cite sources. Uh, and that's such a minor shift, but again, keeping positive in second person and corrections and improvements needed in third person really can make a difference in how the student is receiving the feedback and how they feel about themselves. So what questions do you have before we move forward from there? I have a quick question. Sure. At the beginning of this section, you mentioned, you know, some of us are doing Zoom, hybrid, in person. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we never know what's going to happen considering what's going on with mm -hmm. um, COVID. Can you tell me um, how we would be notified if we need to pivot? Like I'm an in person, I'm teaching in person. So how would I be notified if I need to pivot and go into uh, go online? Or, go ahead, Amy. Mm -hmm. You will get an email that is sent out to either all faculty or just to you, depending on your class. And so if there is someone in your class that has to be quarantined, the school is going to contact you by email and tell you and your dean or director, this person, this student is in your class, they're having to quarantine, here's the information. If you're a close contact, the school will also contact you and tell you that you are a close contact and need to quarantine and as a result need to pivot onto online. If the entire school had to do that, an email will come to all of us at our, my dot, at our nscc.edu email addresses and it would be posted on the Nashville State website. And so telling students that the Nashville State website is going to be the first source of information but then also following up with, if our class has to change, I will post in the new section of our course and email everyone through detail. Mm -hmm. And that way students know that when you know if something has to change, you're shifting. And that doesn't take away the fear or the, oh no, what if we have to, but it at least gives everyone a plan. And it says, if we have to do this, we have a plan what we're doing. And so we are able to take away a little bit of the fear of what if. Mm -hmm. And which leads to you all, obviously we're teaching in a very unique time. I mean, in 25 years of teaching, this has definitely been uh, the most unique, uh, well, and really challenging, I mean, if we're honest, but it is really important that our students feel confidence from us and that we're capable of being flexible. This is gonna be okay. If things change, you'll be informed. Uh, because I, it would be really easy to be, for all of us to be like, oh, how do we don't have the answers, we don't know. And if we seem anxious, that's gonna make them anxious. So uh, it's just a time of, we don't know, right? That's the time we're living in. But them knowing that, as Amy said, giving that information, if change happens, this is where it'll be posted, you'll get an email, all of those things, at least they know. Um, and that's really all we can do at this point. But I, I do think it being, if we can be as positive as possible about it, uh, it will help some with how our students are feeling about it. Other questions, and that was a great question. Um, other questions? I have a quick question. Sure. So I'm wondering, do I need to uh, submit my syllabus to a system before a certain date? You will. You will submit your syllabus to your course shell at elearn.nscc.edu before the classes start on Monday morning. Uh, Monday, and let me get the date right because I don't have my calendar up right here. Monday, August 23rd. You want to make sure that it's there before Monday, August 23rd. And usually you will also be asked to submit your syllabus to your dean by email. And each dean has different emails that they prefer for it to go to. But you'll probably learn more about that tonight in the adjunct orientation or the adjunct orientation that's done on individual campuses. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Other great questions. As we're modeling, we're really comfortable with silence. And so it is absolutely okay to use that in the class. I did want to point out that in the chat, I've put lots of different links for you throughout. The last link is a feedback form. If you could complete that today by just clicking on the link and letting us know your thoughts about this workshop, and how it went, it would help us as we prepare for workshops in the future. We also want you to know at the next to the last, link where it says the teaching center website that takes you directly to our website as neely and mentioned earlier plethora of resources there workshops that you can come to workshops that have occurred in the past that you can watch to record you're also able to, as an adjunct at nashville state to pursue our culturally responsive teaching practices certificate and more information is available about that where you see crtp right here we're here as a resource for you and we want you to know that as teachers who are in the classroom with you, we understand that teaching is a sport that's better done when you have a team of people around you. And so we and online learning are here to say, when you need help, don't feel like you're alone, reach out to us and we will be there to be able to provide additional resources, answer the question, or if we don't know the answer, to be able to point you to the resource that will know the answer, so that we can get those questions answered for you. All right, if anybody has any individual questions, I mean, I'll stick around for a minute. If it's something you didn't wanna ask in front of everybody, kind of just like class ourselves with students sometimes, we'll be in here, so we'll stick around. If not, thank you so much for coming. We enjoyed meeting you and we look forward to helping you in the future. Thank you. Thank you.